Mr. David Go Hamilton, Mr. Peter Soleil, Carlos Bo, and all of you, good morning. It's a pleasure to have you hosted at the venue of the Institute of Catalan Studies, the Academy of the Catalan Language and the Institute of Research in nearly all the science and the humanities. Chemistry is not what it used to be, and this is good news for both chemists and plain citizens. And this European conference on theoretical and computational chemistry you have convened here and celebrated here is a good proof of that. Our institute has had and has outstanding chemists among its members. One of my predecessors uh, at the presidency of the institute was Professor Henri Casasas, a noted analytical chemist. And the Catalan Society of Chemistry is one of the most active of our daughter scientific societies. We have 28 of these uh, filial societies whose members total near uh, now uh, 9,000, and one of which goals, in addition to the research, is linking the sciences and the humanities with the society. Together with the five sections of the Institute, they publish over 50 scientific journals, mainly in Catalan language, and thus they promote not only science but also the creation of new scientific works in our language. I am not a chemist, but a biologist that has worked for many years as a marine ecologist and who has had many contacts with chemistry and chemists. I must say that I have a love-hate relationship with chemistry. Hate because I have studied the pollution ravaged and ecological impoverished marine bottoms of Barcelona, affected by the dumping of depuration as large as fall of all types of pollutants, also, uh, uh, the bottoms of the Marmenor Lagoon, poisoned by heavy metal mine tailings, and of the Galician coast and Rias, where uh, oil spilled from tankers accumulate periodically. But also love, because one of the objects of my studies, the beautiful Opis de Branch Mollusk, uh, beautiful marine animals, produce chemical substances acting as, defensing, as defensive or other types of signals. And I and my students have long collaborated with the Spanish and Italian chemists uh, to discover these natural products and study its eventual application. For many years, I have been a member of the scientific committee of a leading Italian research center uh, the Instituto per la Chimica di Molecole di Interesse Biologico at Naples. Its current name has changed to. Uh, thus, I have shared with the chemists the thrill of discovering new molecules. I hope you have had a good meeting and I invite you to come again to meet in the Institute of Catalan Studies and to enjoy again the beauty and hospitality of our institute and of the city of Barcelona, uh, then farewell and return soon to share your science with us. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Ross, Professor Bo, Professor Charlie, welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Buenos dias, damas y caballeros. And just as a response to your kind words, thank you very much for your kind words. I think chemistry is changing dramatically and the chemical industry and all chemists are now very, very keen to make the industry greener and cleaner and remove the hatred you have for the subject. So I hope very soon you will only love it <laughs> because it does everything for us. Before I move to the main purpose of my being here, which is to present Ursula with a prize, I hope you don't mind if I say a few words about the division of computational and, and theoretical chemistry. I'm the president of UCHEMS and I've been the president for the last three years. 
And one of the things I've tried to do is to develop close links with the divisions in the working parties. And I would say that this division of uh, computational and theoretical chemistry has been exemplary in trying to engage with that process. Your past president, Antonio Lagana, who's been mentioned in almost every lecture we had this morning, I notice he's a very famous man, um, has been very, very helpful to the community and to the executive board. He represented the executive board, uh, represented the divisions on the executive board and was tireless in trying to drive particularly open and large data projects through the European community. Uh, and he involved UCAMS in all of those, bring, building strong bonds between the division and the center of UCAMS. And I understand that Carlos Bo has recently, yesterday, agreed to join a revenue sharing scheme which will allow the division to have some funds of its own so you can expand the things that you do. And I think that's really very important. Thank you, Carlos. And I'm sure that your new president, well, year old president, Peter Jolly, will also continue to encourage these important links to develop even further. So I'm really very pleased with how this particular division is developing, and I think it's in very good hands, and I hope it will go further. So now for the main business of, for my being here, it, it's a very great honor and a pleasure for me to present to Ursula Ruthslisberger of the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne with the UCHEMS Lecture Award for 2015. The UCHEMS Lecture Award is given for outstanding contributions in area, any area of chemistry. In Ursula's case, these contributions have been in the area of computational chemistry, so it's entirely appropriate that I should pre present the award at this fine European conference on theoretical and computational chemistry here in Barcelona. Ursula's work is characterized by deep insight and great originality. She has developed a mixed quantum mechanical molecular mechanics extension to the car Paranello methods, which allows the in situ simulation of processes in complex and real systems. She's used this new methodology to mimic very complex enzymatic reactions and biomimetic compounds. More importantly, however, her extension is now used by groups all over the world and has allowed a step change in computational chemistry. Not content with one great innovation, Ursula, Ursula has also proposed an, innovation, an innovative solution to the treatment of van der Waals interactions, a problem that has haunted theorists for many years. Ursula has published over 300 papers, has an H index of 54, and has used her methods on topics as disparate as dye-sensitized solar cells, atom clusters, and biological systems. She's won many awards for chemistry, but I was particularly interested in the Doron Prize, through which recognition is given to individuals and institutions that devote time, energy, and or financial resources to the fields of social welfare, humanitarian, culture, and scientific activities. It's usually given to groups who carry out charitable works or try to bridge divides. Ursa is one of the very few scientists who have run, won this prize, even though science is one of the areas for which it's given. And she won it for her internationally leading work in computational chemistry. But also, and as, if you read the citation, it's very interesting. There's a section at the end which says how much she's done to help other female scientists particularly uh, to reach their full potential, especially through mentoring and encouragement. And I think that's a, a wonderful thing that we have amongst that and fits in very well, I think, with the mission of the Catalan Institute that you were mentioning earlier. So it gives me very great pleasure to award the 2015 UCAMS Lecture Award to Ursula Ruthlisberg.
Can you hear me? Yes. Well, of course, I would like to start by thanking uh, UCAMS for this great honor. I am really very grateful for this, uh, for this award. And also I'm grateful for uh, the local organizers to organize this very inspiring conference in this absolutely magnificent environment. So as many of you, I'm interested in uh, quantum chemical methods that we can use to understand the chemical reactions that occur in different environments. And okay, in uh, our case, we are especially interested in methods where we can combine this electronic structure information directly with dynamics, that we can look at uh, systems, extended systems at finite temperatures. And uh, I will try to convince you that sometimes it can be very useful to have also this uh, possibility to let the atoms move. For example, it can help us to find where actually the reactive side in a, in a system can be. For example, here we see a transition metal drug that is currently binding to DNA. And okay, we can use molecular dynamics to actually search for the preferen preferential uh, attack point. Or also, of course, if you have one single uh, configuration, then okay, static uh, electronic structure methods can give you a lot of information. But if there are many, many different conformations that contribute, or I don't really know that my conformation has to change first to allow for an attack, then MD can be very useful. And okay, you can use this in the electronic ground state but you can also go to electronically excited states and uh, look at uh, um, photochemistry that is occurring in complex environments. So the type of methods that we have been uh, developing and applying, they can be really used for a whole range of different uh, systems, starting from very small molecules where we have often a lot of experimental information or can validate our computational tools with high-level methods, up to clusters, to liquids, to very extended biological systems like transmembrane proteins. We're also um, interested in material science applications and uh, mostly work on um, solar harvesting uh, systems. Okay, so today I will try to show you some examples where we use this more traditional type of tools in uh, computational chemistry and start trying to link them up with different type of algorithms that are used in artificial intelligence. Now for us, this is a new field, but I think more and more um, the, field, the people in computational chemistry and molecular simulation start realizing that this can be a very fruitful combination. And okay, this is the very last talk after a very rich, scientifically rich uh, conference, and I'm the only thing that is between you and your lunch. So I thought I maybe start a bit on a lighter point and show you the kind of tools that we are using in a bit more cartoon type of uh, fashion. So as I mentioned, we use electronic structure methods. And in our case, this is mostly density functional theory. And so we use sometimes higher level methods to calibrate things. And as I said, okay, this can help us to really kind of characterize the local minima on the potential energy surfaces. But we also lose a lot of classical molecular dynamics um, at the force field level. And with this, we can sample larger portion of the potential energy surface. But most of the time, we really like to use, okay, so we have on one side more kind of quantum picture that I just uh, kind of symbolized here with uh, the Schrodinger equation. And on the other side, we have the more classical uh, dynamics in Newton's equation of motion. And okay, what we are really mainly interested in is to combine these two different kind of worlds into what it's called usually first principle molecular dynamics, Carparinello molecular dynamics uh, was the first pioneering work in this. And if you want to go to very large system, we also can extend this to a QMMM approach. So this, what you are mainly using, QMMM, Carparinello molecular dynamics. So this is kind of our 
favorite uh, region in computational method space. And if you want, this is kind of like a combination of these two. So for us, we have these kind of uh, possibilities on the computers to combine these different worlds. And as I mentioned, I think more and more people in this community start realizing that we kind of accumulate so much data that it can be very useful to use some algorithms from artificial intelligence. Okay, so just to give you a little bit more uh, detail, what we are really doing and what we are really using, as, as I mentioned, we, we use a QMMM extension that we have been developing to the guard part in a lock code. So, okay, they are the electronics underlying electronic structure methods density function theory in a plain wave implementation with pseudo-potentials, mostly GTA type uh, functionals. And so we can also use hybrid functionals for, for some cost. And okay, the idea is, of course, uh, what you're all used to. We can partition the system into an, a kind of electronically active region, the QM region, and treat the rest then at the molecular mechanics level. And okay, for biomolecular systems, this is usually done by uh, some of the standard force fields like amber or chromos. And okay, with this, we can already kind of set up the system and uh, okay, if we are uh, lucky enough and the reaction barriers are not too high, we can actually already observe spontaneously how, for example, the chemical reaction in the active side of an enzyme is occurring. And okay, this can give us really useful hints because maybe we don't really know which residues are really involved. And you see, for example, here, these proton transfers happening. So, in this case, this is really very useful because we can get all this information in an unbiased way. Now, most of the time, the barriers are too high that we can see that spontaneously because the type of time scales that we can cover with this is between 10 and 100 picoseconds. So for anything that has higher activation energies, we have to use enhanced sampling methods like meter dynamics or uh, thermodynamic integration. As I mentioned, we also have extended this to electronically excited state in the framework of time-dependent density functional theory. And we have also the possibility to not only run adiabatic excited state dynamics, but include non-adiabatic effects via surface hopping, or via kind of a mean field description of the nuclear dynamics in an Ehrenfeld type of formulation by uh, combining it with real-time propagation density functional theory. We're also using dispersion corrections, our favorite scheme that we have been developing some, uh, some years ago. And okay, to come to my main topic, so how do we kind of combine or why would we want to combine these kind of traditional tools with uh, artificial intelligence? And artificial intelligence, okay, is a very vast type of uh, term that can um, cover many different approaches. Well, I'm just, they'll show you kind of three specific examples where I think that, okay, we can really profit a lot. And I'm sure there are many, many other possibilities. The first one is that, okay, maybe artificial intelligence uh, type of representations can help us to uh, speed up molecular dynamics, especially at the first principle levels and go to much longer time scales. And what I'm going to show you today, some examples how we can use machine learning models to directly predict energy and forces for the molecular dynamics run. Now, let me start with this. So, uh, or maybe let me start with a small digression. So, of course, going to longer timescales is the everlasting dream of molecular dynamics. Since the existence of molecular dynamics, people want to go to longer timescales because, okay, then we can, uh, um, do simulations in real time of uh, phenomena that happen on nanosecond because of microsecond, millisecond time scales, but also going to longer time scales improves the, uh, the sampling of all our um, ensemble averages, so the accuracy of the method. And okay, people, as I mentioned, since the beginning of molecular dynamics, people have been thinking of clever methods to enhance sampling and to and increase the time scales. Now, in my group, we are working on many different uh, approaches that have the goal of 
doing very fast molecular dynamics, but without really compromising the accuracy. Of course, the usual way that we know in, in all quantum chemistry, if you want a result faster, you usually have to go to a lower level method. But we sacrifice some accuracy in this step. So the kind of dream would be that, OK, we can have high level accuracy, but for the cost of a low level method. And actually, as I said, we mostly hear the density function GGA level, but OK, we would like to run at least dynamics at this, uh, with this cost, but for hybrid type accuracy or even some higher uh, uh, electronic structure methods, or even go the other way around and say, can we run at the classical force field uh, cost, but with DFD accuracy? OK, so sounds like uh, magic, but uh, I will show you some example that at least we can profit from uh, this type of approaches to quite a lot uh, big extent. Now, OK, one way, direct way of um, increasing the time scale of simulation is, as I said, we go fully to a lower level method. And, how, and the way to recover the accuracy of the lower level method is maybe to parameterize this lower method in such a way that the results become closer and closer to the results at the higher level. And one example for doing this is what we call QMMM force matching, a method that we have been developing some years ago where we can use the simulation data that we gain from QMMM simulation to kind of teach a force field to become as close as possible to the DFT results. So we have seen many examples also during the conference that sometimes you don't have an appropriate force field or it will take you a long time to parameterize uh, your system. So in this case, you will just include all what you don't know how to describe at the force field level in the QM part. And OK, you will set up the system with a first order approximate force field. And you will then adapt the force field parameters in such a way that the forces that are acting on every atom in the QMMM simulation and in the MM simulation are as close as possible. So we call this force matched uh, force field. So it's, an, it's a way to automatically generate uh, force field from your data and also to decide if you need, for example, fixed point charge representation, do you need to have explicit polarization, and so on. You can do the same thing by parameterizing a semi empirical methods. And here, for example, we have been applying this to density functional uh, tight binding to reparameterize the repulsive part. And we have been very ambitious at the time because we tried to do that for liquid water, and everybody knows that density functional tight binding for liquid water is horrible. And in, indeed, you can see this here in the green curve when you look at the pair correlation function, oxygen, oxygen, pair correlation function. It looks like this, uh, very discouraging. Uh, doesn't even have a second uh, shell. So very unstructured. And OK, here we didn't use force matching, but we used um, uh, iterative Boltzmann inversion. And OK, with uh, successive iterations, we can actually get to the PVE results in a, in a fast, fast way. So you can also reparameterize semi-empirical methods. And OK, also the dynamic uh, properties, diffusion coefficient, and so on, of course, improve accordingly. OK, so but uh, let me get, uh, OK, so as I mentioned, we are, we are developing at the moment methods that help us to kind of drive the dynamics at a lower level method with the cost of a lower level method, but have the accuracy of the higher level methods. And the way that we are doing that is making use of so-called multiple time step molecular dynamics. If you assume that you have a pretty good estimate of the atomic forces at the lower level method, and there is actually only quite a small difference in the forces if you would go to a higher level method, then, OK, maybe this small difference will vary in time very slowly. And actually, this is often the case if you think that the only difference between, uh, say, for example, hartree fock and MP2 is correlation. And correlation is something that is not highly dependent on the nuclear position or in terms of density functional theory. The exchange correlation part has no explicit dependence on the external potential. 
So if you can do this, and okay, your higher level method correction, the force correction is very smooth, you can calculate this, this correction at very long time steps. And that means you can run, for example, um, um, LDA dynamics and okay, every big time step here, uh, you have to evaluate then the forces at your hybrid level. And this ratio between the small and the big time step can be anywhere between 10 and 20. So we can actually run molecular dynamics at a high level with very large time steps. And we can get uh, speed ups here of the order of uh, factor of 10, which is a lot, so one order of magnitude without any approximation. So the resulting dynamics is the one at higher level. Here's another example to do MP2 dynamics, for example, with an underlying uh, LDA calculation. Or you can go, as I said, the other way around. You can uh, run even at the classical force field level, but get the accuracy of uh, uh, a density functional type description. So, but let me go back to uh, my uh, original promise and say, okay, what about um, artificial intelligence and what about directly using machine learning? So if you run molecular dynamics, all of you know this, you have to generate 10,000, 100,000 uh, configurations. Each time you have a given nuclear configuration, you calculate energy, you calculate forces. At some point you would think that, okay, if I encounter a configuration, it should be possible to say what the energy and forces are after I sampled 100,000 of configurations that are similar. So this is typical kind of situation where machine learning models can be very powerful. So you have enough data and, okay, the machine learning model will be an efficient way of interpolating between all the data that you have and say, okay, this configuration is somewhere in between something that I've already encountered. What is the energy or what are the forces that are acting on that? So to kind of get the force field, if you want, directly from machine learning models, and this is very fast. So we have been uh, trying to do that, and okay, you have, first of all, you have the option, do you want to predict the total energy, so the potential energy surface, and I take the gradient and I get the forces, or do I want to directly predict the forces? Now, there are many people that have been um, representing potential energy surfaces, machine learning models very accurately, a whole list of literature, if uh, you are interested in that. But the problem with this is usually you need really a lot of data. You have uh, energy that is such a kind of global uh, quantity. So you have maybe uh, positions for uh, your 100,000 or whatever uh, atoms, and you have one single number that characterizes this. If I go to forces, okay, I have force on every single atom. And of course, this gives me much more information. So what we have been trying to do is directly predict forces that are acting on every atom in our systems. And for this, we have actually adapted the so-called gradient domain machine learning approach that was recently uh, published by Klaus Müller. So the idea is, again, okay, we directly predict vector quantities, so forces. And okay, as for all machine learning models, you've seen also an example this morning, you need descriptors. So I need a compact way of characterizing what type of chemical environment my atom I is in. And okay, I can just take the coordinates of all other atoms, but that's not a very convenient uh, description. It's not very compact. And it's also depending on translation and rotation. So it's not a good representation. I want something that is much more compact that can say, okay, now my atom I is in this environment. So the force acting on this atom must be that. So, the, in the gradient domain machine learning model, Klaus Müller has used uh, uh, a Coulomb matrix to predict forces on small organic molecules, so only intramolecular forces, no intermolecular forces, very small system with very few species. 
but we are mostly interested go to extended system, many species and also many different type of atoms and uh, also in condensed phase. So we have been trying different descriptors, but the one that uh, seems to work pretty well is something that kind of includes sort of a three-body terms for characterizing the environment of uh, atom I. So it's depending on the charges and on distances around. And OK, this has the advantage that, OK, it's translation rotational invariant, and we can also take analytic derivatives very easily. And OK, so every configuration that we sample now, for example, the full first principle molecular dynamics level, we can characterize with this molecular descriptor M. And OK, if I now have a new configuration described by this molecular descriptor M, I want to know what the force is on a specific atom. I can describe this now in terms of an interpolation between everything that I know already. So kernel functions that span this space that I have been training on a training set with molecular descriptors MI. And in this case, OK, we use directly gradients of kernel functions. And OK, we can get the corresponding energy easily by just direct integration. So one advantage of this GDML is that, OK, it's um, fully energy conserving by construction. So OK, we use this, and now we have to determine what are the coefficients to this optimal coefficients and what is the form of my kernel function? And then, uh, I'm very pleased because I'm getting uh, congratulations from some of you, but this is not fair because uh, you need to congratulate and give thanks also to the all members of the, of the organizing committee. I've been very lucky to have this uh, great team uh, working for this project, and you know them, but thanks Anna Clutet, Ramon Crewet, Marcel Dalmau, Laura Masgrau, Ramon Sayos, Miquel Sula and Gregorio Jaque. Gracias a todos. And last but not least, again, thanks to the companies that have sponsored this meeting, and especially to SEM from Amsterdam, Mind the Bite and HPC Now from Barcelona. Without them and without you all, this conference wouldn't be possible. And just uh, the last message uh, regarding certificates and paperwork and all those things that you will need when you reach, again, your offices. If you need any certificate, assistance certificate, uh, talk certificate, uh, just uh, drop an email to the technical secretariat and they will send it by email. Yeah? And that's all, folks. Uh, thanks uh, a lot again. And on behalf of the Chemical Society and of the local committee, I wish you very success and luck in your research. Uh, I wish you a very safe trip back home. And just uh, looking forward to meet you soon, and hopefully maybe in Liverpool next year. Thank you. We are not yet done uh, because uh, we have the Wiley Outstanding Poster Award to, to give three colleagues. Uh, not any particular order. Yeah. One goes to Sarah, Sarah Arslan, uh, Arsla Khan. From University of Madrid. Next one uh, goes to Neus Aguera Porta. Uh, again from Madrid. And finally, finally the, the third one goes to Sanya Sivanovic 
from Barcelona. She went there, we were kind. She went home already. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, I would like to say uh, 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 an important thing that we will have a special issue in the uh, Journal of Molecular Modeling. And uh, we, uh, uh, the deadline for the submission will be end of the year, but we would like to ask you to send us a title, a, a preliminary title and topic uh, until the end of the month, as, as it uh, stands on the, on the homepage, so that we can plan uh, with the referees and everything will be prepared and, and we can get a, a, a special issue out uh, as soon as possible. Uh, Carlos already mentioned the next uh, year big chemistry conference uh, or working part, I mean our division is planning to have a special symposium. There will be a section on computational and theoretical chemistry, but it, uh, that will be a general one. There we would like to show what theoretical and computational chemistry can give to the community. But we, we, are, we are also planning a special symposium for us, for ourselves. And this will be on, on, on theory, different aspects of theory and how can we improve our, our work. And finally, uh, in two years, we will have uh, the next meeting. Uh, there are two things to decide. The name, because uh, uh, now we have TCC in the name. The UCO CC changed to UCO TCC, but the name of the division is is CTC, so we have to decide which combination we will carry on. That's, that will be an important thing to decide. Uh, also, the, uh, 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 the place is not yet decide, decided, but I can tell you that we will stay in the Mediterranean region for the next, next, next time. And Carlos told us that it's not to, to, to him to thank, but I think we have to thank Carlos as well for the uh, excellent organization. <laughs> thank you for coming. Only a, a brief comment. Uh, I, I, I know that you, you have uh, some something to eat uh, downstairs, but uh, only f to tell that uh, I will try to follow the suggestion by the president of Eucams in the sense to increase my love for chemistry. Uh, <laughs> I will have to read attentively one of our journals, EduQ. So uh, I think uh, I will arrive to to love more than. Uh, chemistry than, than nowadays, and return as soon as you can. Thank you. <laughs>